everywhere. Yeah. Amen. Let's uh, continue to pray. We have so enjoyed, Lord Jesus, your presence by your spirit this morning. Thank you for the gifts you give the body. Gifts like leading in worship. Gifts like technology. The gifts you've given people here in our church have been our benefit this morning corporately as a group. And we just want to acknowledge that and say thank you, Jesus, for giving your church everything she needs through the gifts of the Spirit. And we thank you for the privilege of worshiping in song and in prayer and in giving back to you. And as we continue our worship, we do so with minds that are open to investigate your word so that we might better align ourselves, our minds and our hearts and our actions with your word. And Lord, it would be a hard task if you didn't also give us your spirit to enable that to happen. It would be impossible. But we invite you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us now. Align our minds, align our hearts, and empower us to move in your truth, we pray. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, we just prayed that vision prayer again. Uh, don't you love it, that prayer? I just feel like dialing in on this vision prayer for the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada is just so important for us because it so impacts so much of what we do and who we are. And we say, oh God, oh God, with all our hearts, not just part of it, all of our hearts we long for you I, I that's a that's a bit of a barometer for me just that first statement uh i just kind of pause and go okay the last yeah seven days since we met last how much of my heart have i allowed to long for god that's a great barometer it just it just keeps me remembering oh god with all my heart not just part of it with all my heart, I long for you. Come. Come and transform. Come and change me. Last week, Paul did just an amazing job bringing the Christ-centered emphasis for us. Did, does, did anybody, nobody forgot the wheel, the bicycle wheel, and, and the, the mental picture of the earth. I, I was looking for him to bring a globe. Uh, but the mental picture of the earth on its axis spinning and Christ being the center. And uh, there were statements he made last week that will stay with me forever. That which is at the center is that around which everything else in your world will revolve. Amen. Oh God, with all our hearts, we long for you. Come and make us Christ-centered. Amen. And then today we're going to look at the second target of God coming to us and transforming us to make us spirit-empowered. Spirit-empowered. It may not be what you're thinking. Because we've grown in an age in North America where the term spirit-empowered been kind of twisted and warped. So I want to present to you what I think is the heart of spirit empowered. Are you ready? It might not hit you where you think. It, it could be a bit of a, a blind sight for us this morning. It was for me as I dug into the word and I asked the Lord, what do you want us to, to where do you want us to go this morning? So here's what I want to say. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they 
will inherit the earth. When you think of spirit empowered, I want you to remember, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word meek in our English language is known to most of our world as gentle, submissive, mild, passive. But the word meek, the way Jesus used it in the Beatitudes, comes from this culture he was living in, in Greece. And he was speaking uh, in either Hebrew or Koine Greek is what the, the, the stories were recorded in. And in Greece, the word meek had tied to it, get this, a Roman war horse bridled. Meekness means power under control. Meekness means power under control. When we think of spirit empowered, we are not thinking of muscle and might and, uh, and all that stuff. And we're not thinking of bold proclamation and aggressive abuse. No, 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 no. When Jesus said he will empower you with his spirit, he said, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Those who are filled with the spirit of God have power under control at work in their life. And there's, there's really two things that the scripture is clear about that said Jesus was doing these two things all the time. First, John 1, John chapter 1, verse 33, John said, Jesus was baptizing in the Spirit, baptizing in the Holy Spirit. He who baptizes is written in the Greek as a present participle. That is, it's timeless. It is ongoing. It is he who is continually baptizing. So John was saying, Jesus is the one who is continually baptizing with the Holy Spirit. First thing Jesus was all about, baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Second, in John 1, 29, John said this, Jesus was taking away sin. This is something else Jesus said by John to have been doing in a continual, ongoing manner. He was baptizing in the Spirit. He was taking away sin. John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes, friends, don't you got to hear this now. Yes, Jesus died once for all. Absolutely. But in that death once for all, Jesus is continually ongoing in an ongoing fashion, taking away the sin of the world. Every heart that comes within realization of the sacrifice once for all finds that for them, the sin is being taken away. Jesus is ongoing, baptizing in the spirit and ongoing, taking away sin. John is saying here, the two great gifts that Jesus, our savior gives is that he's continually baptizing in the spirit. And he's continually taking away the sin of the world. Is that worth an amen? amen? That's amazing. It's not a new thought that just came with John. I want to take you back a little and help you see that even the Old Testament prophets predicted that these are the two main things Jesus would do. We read in Ezekiel chapter 36, starting in verse 25. I will sprinkle, talking about the future here, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, taking away the sin of the world, baptizing in the spirit. Ezekiel taught about this twofold work of Jesus. And then we already read what John wrote. 
Now see with me this same twofold work of Jesus being preached by Peter at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 38. Peter was preaching. He was preaching a fiery sermon. And in the midst of that, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, Peter linked these two great gifts, forgiveness of sin, baptizing in the Spirit. He linked these two together through this gift of salvation that comes to us through Christ. He assured all who were listening that anyone who would repent and believe would receive from God both forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So application for the church. As I asked the Lord this week, okay, this is your word. No, how do you want us to apply it to our life? Um, and this one kind of hit me. So um, I'm, I'm just delivering this to you as from the Lord, and I'll let the Lord deal with how he wants you to receive it. But here's what he said. Please stop talking only about the fact that we're sinners and God saved us from our sin. It's true, but there's more truth than just that. And we've gone off course to a world that's dead in sin. This is only a partial needed message. It's half truth. We must share the whole truth. Listen to what Pastor Ray Dirksen says from Southland Church. He says, we must never conceive of salvation in purely negative terms, as if it consisted only of our rescue from sin, guilt, wrath, and death. Thank God it is all of those things. But it also includes the positive blessing of the Holy Spirit to regenerate, indwell, liberate, and transform us. Amen. See, there's two parts to this gospel. And the church in North America have been so, the evangelical church in my lifetime, we've been so focused on sinner. <laughs> we, he gave us the spirit to empower us, to move beyond that focus of sin and enjoy the fullness of him. And not only for us to enjoy it for ourselves, or for the Spirit to flow through us, to offer as a gift God's love to the world. It's a universal blessing. So Ezekiel talked about it. John wrote about it. Peter preached about it. All that Jesus would be doing two things. He would be baptizing in the Spirit, and he would be saving people from sin. Let's all agree that moving forward, we will no longer just speak about the need for saving from sin. But when we speak to someone about the need for saving from sin, we will also speak to them about the gift of the Spirit who indwells and empowers them. Listen, if God was the kind of God, I mean, how cruel would it be? How unkind would he be? If he was a God who saves us from sin and then didn't give us the power within that would let us live a holy life. I fear that much of the North American church is living under the umbrella of the knowledge that they're saved from their sin, but they haven't been given the wonderful news that they have the spirit to live in them, to empower them, to to live a holy life. Church, wake up. Let's get the whole story. Confession, for the early part of my life, I was so turned off with the way the Holy Spirit appeared on TV through televangelists that I didn't want anything to do with it. I began to build a personal theology that rejected and resisted everything about the Spirit's work in my life because I was disgusted by what I saw. 
the abuse and the corruption and the twistedness. And then Jesus opened my eyes and said, hey, you're not just a sinner who needed saving. You're also a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he lives in you. And that spirit is given to us so that we don't live in the shadow of our sin. We live in the fullness of his wholeness in us. Oh, what a different perspective for me and you. So the first application is we need to share the whole truth. We need to share the good news fully. Jesus saves us from our sin and he baptizes us in the Holy Spirit, putting us in line with Ezekiel and John and Peter. Second application. Can we put away our bats and our sticks and our stones? and pick up our towels, church. I think the Spirit's speaking to the church. We need to not use the gospel as a weapon of our disgust with the behavior of the world around us. The convicting work of the Holy Spirit is not our weapon. The convicting work of the Holy Spirit is the work of that, the Holy Spirit. Not us. I'm so glad that I don't need to judge you. If I could turn the house lights up and look each of you in the eye right now, I would say, I am so glad I don't need to judge you because I don't want the burden. That's God's job. And I don't need to use the word of God as a stick or a battering ram to change your mind. I can just proclaim the truth and let the spirit Change your mind and your heart. So if you feel under conviction by what I'm saying today, don't blame me. I'm just speaking the word. Blame the spirit. He's trying to get to you. That's how he works. And you know what? As a preacher, that makes my job so much easier. (laughs) I just preach it as long as it's truth. Paul, isn't that right, Ryan? We just preach it. If it's truth, the spirit will move in the people's hearts. And when he moves in your heart more strongly in one sermon than another, it's probably because you have some work to do in that area more than in the other. (laughs) Like that's what he does with me. So let's put away our bats and our battering rams and pick up a towel. Throughout the scripture, when the spirit of God moved into a person's life, He moved through love. He moved through love in such a way that he enabled individuals filled with the Spirit to win favor. When Samuel went looking for a king, and after six brothers were paraded before him, he turns to dad and says, Don't you have another? And the the one brother that the father had forgotten and left in the fields with the sheep came. And God said, that's him. I'm going to love the world through him. And David moved into kingship. You say, how did David love? Do you remember how his life went? How did David rise to stardom? With a slingshot. He slew Goliath, the giant. And the Philistines that had absolutely paralyzed God's people crashed with the giant. David became the leader of the people, even though Saul was still the king. Saul, the king, became jealous because he had sinned against God And God told him, I'm going to remove the kingship from you and I'm going to give it to David. So what did Saul try to do? He tried to throw spears through the middle of David. And David had the chance on two different occasions to take Saul's life safely. I can take him out and I can rise to kingship. But David understood the principles of God that says you don't lay your hand on the king's anointed, on God's anointed. And so David refused to harm Saul 
Instead, he let the spirit work on Saul, better in the long run. And by that, he honored God by loving his king. And in this, David demonstrated a love stronger than I think I might have been able to. In a cave, in the dark, and my enemy who's trying to chase me down and kill me comes in to relieve himself, and I'm close enough that I can cut the hem off his coat, I could easily have taken his life. But David says, I will not lay my hand on the king's anointed, or on, the, on God's anointed. That's love. And that just is a love that was a forerunner to whet our appetite to see the love of God given to us through Jesus. So when the scripture says Jesus, <laughs> Jesus baptized in the spirit and saves us from sin, it's a fuller demonstration of the love that empowered David to not take the king's life. And it's the same love he puts in you and in me. Jesus, the scripture says, grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I'm struck by that theme. It came up in a conversation that I had this week. I was, I was uh, having a FaceTime call with Dr. Warren Reeve from Paris. And uh, we were checking in, as friends do, and he was out in his front yard. He was actually standing on a bridge over the moat that surrounds their home. <laughs> a 300-year-old stone home. That, that, that's where they live in Paris. And he was on the bridge, and he's, he's trying to entice me to come and see him. So he's showing me the river around the home, <laughs> the waterfalls. And, and then his neighbor drives in. And so there's several who live in this large uh, facility, this building. And his neighbor drives in. He opens the gate for the neighbor. And the neighbor comes out of the car. And the neighbor's got her little one-year-old child. And, and he starts a conversation with the neighbor while I'm on the phone and FaceTime. So I met his neighbor and her son, Charlie. And uh, then he walked back away after she had gone in. He said, Gary, you can't believe how God is giving us favor with her and her husband. I said, tell me about it. He said, well, they're not married. They're living together and they got a one-year-old kid. And they came to Debbie and I and said, because we're kind of neighbors and becoming friends, we are going to do a, uh, a dedication to one another, a commitment thing. And we're going to do it right out in front under the, under the uh, what do we call those arches in the garden trellis. And, and it's, it's absolutely magnificently beautiful, the setting. And, and we just want to commit ourselves, our love to one another. So this is an unchurched, unevangelized, we, I think. Okay, And I'm listening to the story through Warren's lenses. And Warren's saying, so I was chatting with her, and they just wanted to do a promise service, a promise thing. And I said, you know, Debbie, my wife, is a professional musician, a singer and songwriter. And I'll bet you if, we asked, if you asked her, she'd sing a song for you guys right there in the front yard during your thing, right? You see where he's going with this? And then he says to her this. He says, actually, you know, I'm a professional Christian. And if you'd like, I could say a few words of blessing for you. See, for, a, for a, a woman in Paris, not familiar with churchy terms, a professional Christian is what a pastor is, right? And so, so she responds to him with tears. And this wall comes down because Warren and Debbie chose not to judge not to throw sticks and stones, not to condemn them for living together and having a kid out of well. No, no, no. They, they said, we could, we could bless you in your commitment time. You know what she said? She said, this is what I've dreamed of. I wanted a church wedding, but the church rejected me. And if you would sing and say some blessing, it would be so special. 
So Warren told me this story only to say, God put them in a neighborhood, in a community, where they are winning favor by demonstrating no judgment, just love. You cannot do that unless you have a deep understanding that you don't have to be the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's powerful enough to do his own work. You need to be the vessel of love that draws people into the presence of the Spirit to do his work. Amen? Yes, there is accountability that comes when we live together in community. And yes, there is room for us to call one another out into commitment, into accountability, into growing in Christ. Absolutely. But when we're dealing with people who are not in Christ, oh, church, put the sticks away. Drop the stones. Take out a towel. Put it over your arm and go across the street and serve them with the love of Jesus. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you beat them up with a stick, no, 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 no. no. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love. So church, put away your bat. Pick up your towel. Ours is not to judge. Ours is to tell the truth, the whole truth. He saves us from sin and he fills us with his spirit. And that empowers us to live in love. It's hard for me to share publicly some of the deep lessons of this nature that I've learned in my life. Some of them come from my own life as a child being bullied and God transforming me to pray for the bullies as I came to Christ. One of the bullies that bullied me in high school ended up himself with a bullet in the back of his head and found in the woods, York Region, 30 years later. I had been praying for his salvation for 10 years. Never got a chance to go and share Jesus with him. Oh, how I, I have remorse, I have regret. But the point is, from being bullied to coming to Christ, to praying for his salvation, only the Spirit of God could change me to do that. In families that I work with, in my own extended family, if I could, if I were permitted, I would tell stories and I could tell you names and I have faces. It's heavy for me. Here's, let me just tell you one story. Young child, sexually abused by older brother and his friend abusing two daughters, two siblings. Girls come to mom and say, mom, this happened. Mom says, we don't talk about that. No one had the willingness to deal with it. And we're talking a long time ago, but this is in this person's history. That person gets married, grows in Christ, enters ministry, and wakes up in the middle of the night having forgotten that horrific abuse until this minute. I believe God put that person in that marriage to provide a place of safety wherein that person could begin to deal with the awful horror of that childhood. That couple deal with the situation. The husband goes to the abuser and says, you will show up at your sister's home tomorrow at nine o'clock. And if you don't, then the police will come to see you at 10. And that husband and wife confront with the other sister, confront the abuser, 
Turns out the second abuser has already died in a car accident. Can't, can't address that. That day, the Spirit of God broke through. And healing began. And forgiveness, because the abuser confessed sin, asked for forgiveness. And this is like 35 years after the event. Could you imagine being the abuser and carrying the weight of your sin for that long? And nobody loved that person enough to give them a way to confront the sin and confess it. We often think mostly about the weight on the abused. Friends, I want to tell you, there are people walking our streets who have such a heaviness because of the guilt of their sin. And they have no way to process it. Until the church loves one another enough to confront sin in love and provide a way out by the Spirit who fills us with power to love. Dial it up. Ten years later, maybe 15, that child who had been molested and then confronted and forgave the abuser. Was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Notified the family. Guess who the first response came from? To reach out in love and support to that adult facing a horrific future. abuser, phoned and wept, said, I love you. I'm here for you. I will walk through anything with you to support you. Folks, you can't make this stuff up. This is the power of the love of God at work in his people who understand I've been saved from my sin and I'm filled with the spirit and the love of God can overcome anything, anything for both the victim and the abuser. I get to watch stories like this as a pastor, and most of them I can't tell you about. And I got permission to generically tell this story because these are the stories that change lives because of the stories that come out of the deep and abiding love of Jesus through the empowering of the Spirit. The Spirit of God empowers me and you to love. Can we throw down our sticks and pick up our towel? Can we, church? Surely. Let me say this. If the love of Jesus doesn't contain the power to forgive, then it's useless. Quit pretending. Go play golf on Sundays. Just got to say it. The power of God unto salvation is a saving power and a spirit-giving power that brings life and empowers me to love through whatever I walk. I told you this wouldn't be the application you were expecting when I talk about spirit empowered. But God has been impressing on me lately that when he pours out his spirit, now friends, I don't have enough time to talk long, but I understand in this room, there are people who say, well, there's a baptism of the spirit, there's a filling of the spirit, there's an ongoing after and over and over again filling of the spirit. And have you been baptized and have you been Filled, oh, and isn't there a blessing, a second blessing? And I don't care what you believe about how the Spirit gets to you. I really don't care. I'm old enough now, they can fire me for bad theology if they want. Here's what I care about. Do you understand that when you came to Jesus, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit? Amen. He can't leave. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. How you experience the Spirit subsequent to salvation 
I think it's different. But there, the scriptures tell us stories about people who found Jesus but not the Spirit. But then when they found this, this, about the Spirit, they received the Spirit with laying on of hands. But that doesn't mean that everybody has to do it that way. There's others who had the Spirit come and then believe. Remember, remember in Acts, the day of Pentecost? They saw tongues of fire and heard, heard everything that was going on. It was like a train locomotive coming through town. They gathered and then Peter preached. So they had seen the power of the spirit and then they believed, they repented. And they said, what then shall we do? That's what they said to Peter. Peter said, repent and believe and you'll receive the spirit that you just saw. Oh, so that's different than the others who, yeah, I don't care how. Here's what I care. I care that you know that you have the spirit of Christ living in you. And I care that you are in an ongoing way, uh, as Ephesians 5 calls it, be in the process of ongoingly being filled with the Spirit. When we worship on Sunday mornings, I find it hard to sing with us because my heart is just calling out to God and saying, oh, Spirit, come. Come and fill this place. Come and descend on us. Rain down on us. Fill every heart. There are hurts that need to be healed. There are things that are thought that need to be straightened out and lined up with your word. Come, Spirit, do your work because I can't change anyone. That's what I'm doing when we're worshiping. And he does. Didn't you feel his Spirit's presence this morning as we worship? He comes and he does his work, the convicting work, the teaching work taking it from the brain and moving it to the heart so that it becomes part of our actions. He saved us. He fills us with his spirit. He baptized us in the spirit. And he keeps doing that. Young boy, story, story was told about a young boy standing at a bus stop and an old professor walked up beside him. And the young boy had just come to faith in Christ. In an excited way, he said to the old professor, Sir, have you been saved? And the professor stood back and he crossed his arms and, you know, the, the way professors do. And he said, young man, I have been saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved. Theologically, that guy was bang on. He, there was a time and a place where he came to understand Jesus as his Savior. And he said, I, am being I have been saved. But every moment of my life, I am in the process of the salvation of Jesus working deeper into my life. And one day, there will be a judgment, and I will be saved because of Jesus. He was bang on. You see, the work of God in our hearts is progressive. It's ongoing. Spirit empowered doesn't have to mean yelling and screaming. I, I, do you want me to tell you one more quick story? I think I got time. So Pam and I were newlyweds. We moved out to Saskatchewan. I left engineering and uh, began to retrain for ministry. While we were out there, I became an elder in my church, and I was teaching the, the college and career group. And I was uh, introduced to a, a whole ministry of healing and deliverance uh, by Dr. Or by Reverend Dick Sipley, who was our pastor there. And we had a pretty good sized church. There were eight or 900 people there. It was one of the, the larger churches in Regina at the time. And on Father's Day in our worship service, the pastor did something different. And, and I loved this guy because he had guts and courage in the spirit and did something different. He called all the men of the church to get up out of their chairs and go and surround the, the, the whole room. And then he called the men to hold hands. And then he began to pray over the men that they would be a protection to the church family, that they would be godly men, that they would be strong, that they would uh, be speaking health and wholeness and healing and grace and love into the lives of the women and children. I mean, it just was like one of the most beautiful things so I'm at the back because I've got my son, Doug, in my arms. He's maybe like nine months old, okay? And two men over from me in the back corner, this noise starts to come. And it's like the roaring of a lion. 
in a sound that I couldn't understand. But I knew this man, and through my deliverance team ministry, I knew that the day before, that man had been in a deliverance session and that it hadn't gone very well. There was some deep, unconfessed sin that he wasn't ready to release, and so the team wasn't able to free him. Sorry, that's just simple how it goes. Sometimes unconfessed sin keeps us from moving closer to God and from being set free. And so this demon that, that was impacting this man began to shout out. Now, Reverend Sipley stood about five foot three, and he's at least 250 feet away because there's a long, one of those old traditional long, narrow sanctuaries. And so if you can imagine, Sipley's up there, and, and he's standing, and, and he hears this, he's praying, and he hears this kerfuffle at the back, and this roar starts to come up. And he stands there, and he looks. And then he just softly says, in the name of Jesus, you be silent. And the sound just went wrong and stopped. And it stopped until the moment the preacher stepped away from his pulpit. For the next, four, back then, sermons were 55 minutes long. I know, some of you are freaking out. But that, and we loved them. We ate them all up. Anyway, 55 minutes later, after the sermon, then this thing started to erupt again. And by then, a few of us around him knew what was going on. And so we just spoke to it and silenced it. But here's my point. In a room full of about 800 people on a Sunday morning service, that preacher had a chance to really showboat the power of God. But the best way he could demonstrate the love of God and the power of God was to quietly silence the spirit and get on with the message of the day. See, I think that was a more powerful statement to me as a young man. I don't need to scream at demons. They're under authority. I'm under a higher authority. Therefore, they have to listen to me, and I don't have to scream at them. You, you know how in parenting they go, um, Mom and Dad, you don't have to scream at your kids. Same principle applies. Mom and Dad, you're the authority. The child is not the authority. You don't have to scream. Don't go down to their level. Spirit-filled Christian. Demons are under the authority of the demons above them. You're under the authority of Jesus. Your authority is higher than theirs. You don't have to scream at them. What we have to do is love. Because where there's a demonic activity, there is a soul that God loves in that person that's being influenced by the demon. And only the love of Jesus will penetrate that soul. Screaming at them will not do it. Do you, do you see where I'm going with that? We can put down our sticks and our stones. We can pick up our towel. And in the name of Jesus, just love. All right, I'm so far off my notes. First John chapter 3. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who doesn't love remains in death. Listen, now this is so important for us to understand. Love is the demonstration that we have passed from death to life. It's not an, oh, by the way, if you can, love them. It's a requirement. It's, I mean, John is so serious that he even says this in verse 15. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Friends, this is so powerful. Back to the story about the child of abuse. As a victim of abuse, you have the capacity to be a murderer if you continue to hate. Just got to say it. But I want to tell you, the spirit of Jesus who lives in you can heal you. 
and restore you and provide for you the power to love in spite of victimization. Some of you older people know the name Corey Ten Boom. In a concentration camp, she watched guards rape and kill her sister. Her family had been caught hiding Jews in their home. So off to the camps they went. Years later, Corey Tenboom was telling her story in America. And in the crowd, a man came forward at the end of the service that she was talking about love and forgiveness because she forgave those who had killed and molested her sister. And the man came forward and he said, I need to speak to her if I might. And when she looked at him, although 40 years later, she locked eyes with the man who had raped and killed her sister, who had then come to America and that night had found salvation in Jesus. And Corey Ten Boom was able to stand as the victim and say to this man, I love you. No psychology can do that. No philosophy can do that. Only the indwelling spirit of Christ can give someone the power like that to love. Oh, friends. I've seen it in lives of people in this church who've chosen love. And stories like that give me such energy to keep loving. So church, I say, way to go. Keep it up. Keep telling people that they're dead in their sin and they can be saved from their sin. And keep telling people that Jesus fills them with his spirit, baptizes them with his spirit. And that spirit living in you gives you the power you need to love. Peter says later on, he says, by the power of his spirit living in you, by his divine power, you've been given everything you need for life and godliness. Wow. That word everything is a beautiful word. Oh God, with all our hearts, we long for you. Come. And make us, transform us to be Christ-centered and spirit-empowered. Lord, if there's some who are with us today who haven't heard that your spirit lives in them, would you just give them a fresh revelation of your spirit living in them today? Paul wrote and said to the church, the kingdom of God, actually it was Jesus who said to the church, the kingdom of God is not about words. It is about power. And that power is the power of the spirit, which is a power to love unconditionally. So Lord, we confess that we have too often only told part of the story. Forgive us. Give us the courage now to not only share that we're sinners who can be saved by grace, but we're also filled with the Spirit and empowered to love. Two of the primary things Jesus came to do. And Jesus said, you will do even greater than me. Lord, for those who are with us who heard some of my stories today and are aching to know power of forgiveness toward others who have injured them. Oh, Spirit, come. The Old Testament writer said there is a balm, a healing uh, salve in Gilead. And they meant by that that there is a healing that comes from God the Father that soothes the ache and the pain of our souls because we've been wrongly done by. Holy Spirit, come and heal those wounds now. 
We receive your love. We thank you for salvation that is ours. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come and fill us afresh now. And fill us with the capacity to live for you and love in your name. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
As we hold to this assurance, Spirit, come, Spirit, come, Spirit, come. Your glory fill this house, pour it out, let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. I referred in the sermon to the book of Joel. Prophet Joel and some of the words that he gave us. I'm going to just read a little bit from Joel because he prophesied about this day of the Lord, this season in the end times, that if we're not already in, we are very close to. He said this, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth. Later on, he says, and everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, I wonder if some of the wonders that will be shown in heaven and on earth is the undeniable power of the love of God demonstrated by his people who are empowered by his spirit. Because this, as we've described this morning, is a wonder unexplainable, except that a loving God loves us and empowers us by his spirit to love others. So go in the love of God our Father. Go in the grace of his son, Jesus, and go in the power of his spirit who lives in you. And all God's people said, amen. See you tomorrow night at seven here at the church for our congregational meeting. Pour it out, let your love run over here and now, let your glory house, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this house, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this house, pour it out. Tongues of fire, prophesying of the sun. One desire, spirit come, spirit come, speak revival. Prophesy like it is done. One desire, spirit come, spirit come, tongues of fire. Testifying of the sun, one desire. Spirit come, spirit come, speak revival. Prophesy like it is done, one desire. Spirit come, spirit
pour it out. Let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. Pour it out. Let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. 